So welcome everyone to today's e-meeting. It's on a new program here at Eurodis called um, Community Advisory Boards. I'm in a very cold and very rainy Barcelona. Um, and Francois is with me from in Paris in the Eurodis offices. Um, I will open up the presentation at the beginning to talk about basically what is a community advisory board. Then we'll open it up to questions for everyone who's who's listening. Um, and then there will be a second part of Francois talking about the more logistical parts of, of the program of how to actually get it going. And again, we'll open it up to questions. Um, because there are now 21 people online, and maybe others will join, um, if you could please use the little the little person up top with the, the raised hand um, to signal that you'd like to ask a question because otherwise we might have um, a little bit of um, traffic asking questions at the same time. Um, so just remember to use the, the little man when you're asking questions. Um, so there's no other housekeeping except uh, again welcome um, and thanks for coming in and um, let's see how if you're interested in um, being able to set up a community advisory board for your disease area. Um, without further ado, this is me again in another another version. Um, I'm what's called a senior manager um, for the, the CAB program here at Eurodis. Um, and I've had 22 years, 23 years of, of CAB experience, starting with um, CAB in HIV in 1995. Um, and I've also had experience um, at Eurodis with other um, earlier versions of, of the CAB already for um, tuberous sclerosis, for systemic sclerosis, and there's a, a, a continuing one for cystic fibrosis. Um, and just to mention that in, in the USA, I also did a little bit of work with um, the AIDS clinical trial group as a community constituent as well. So that's me. Um, I'm sort of, um, I, I, I was for many years um, a freelancer for Eurodis and now I'm, I'm um, on staff. Um, this is Francois. Um, Francois is my, my boss and he's the Director of Treatment Information and Access at Eurodis. Um, he has a similar trajectory with CABS, um, beginning with um, TR, a group called TRT5 in, in France in, also in 1995. Um, I'm sorry, I, I get a little jittery with the with the mouse. I'll try not to move it too much. Um, and he also was with me in the um, European Community Advisory Board um, since that same year. Um, Francois was able to figure out how many clinical trials he's reviewed, which has been quite a few um, in in a, in a CAB situation, um, and and how many products those those trials related to. I should do the same for mine. I haven't yet, and I. I, I promise I will because I know it's 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 bigger numbers than than Francois, but that's for another day. Um, so today, this is what we're going to do. We're going to give a little introduction of what's a community advisory board. That's the basic idea of of the meeting for today. Um, we'll give you a little bit of our experience um, in detail with exist with existing cabs. Um, we'll each give one example of. What, what we call true stories, which are true stories of what happened in our experience with, with CABS. Um, we won't be going into pharma needs today. That's why I put, put it in italics. We'll be skipping over that today. Um, but we then will go into um, putting a, a community advisory board into practice. That is, we've developed standard operating procedures, including things like practical and financial arrangements and so forth. Um, and we'll also talk about, about um, any conflicts that may may arise from from being in a community advisory board, and Francois will do the, the, those second two in his second talk. Um, so if I can just go forward, if I'll, I'll try to keep an eye on the list over here. If someone says I'm going too fast, let me know, and I'll I'll I'll, I'll try to slow down a little. Um, so for for us, community advisory boards really are turning patients into expert patients who will be able to advise research in making clinical trials and the clinical process more patient-friendly and more patient-relevant. Um, 
This is from an original diagram that was published in um, the DIA um, journal last year on therapeutic evaluation. And it's been slight, slightly revised, but basically these are all the places where we, we know patients can give an added value to doing the same process without patients. And everything from the very beginning, I suppose I could use my um, over, over on the left when um, possibly a scientist or a, a, a scientific team in a, a company gets an idea, the first thing they, they should do is talk to patients. Say, does this idea make sense? Is this useful for you? Um, are there ways that you might consider that you might consider um, adapting our ideas to make it more relevant, more useful for patients. Um, and I don't mean to interrupt the flow, but someone just asked if we'll get the PowerPoint presentation. And yes, um, the this presentation will be available uh, about one week from today online in where the where the webinars are are located on on the Ordis.org website. Um, so patient involvement, again, just to repeat, can be everything from when it's simply an idea, not even a, a, a molecule yet, and then all the way over to the, to the other end of the, of the spectrum of the, of the research life cycle um, for post-approval, um, pharmacovigilance, even um, HTA involvement, where um, patients can help make rational decisions about the use and, 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 and access to, to new medicines. Uh, pharmacovigilance is really important for reporting side effects so, and so forth. And again, um, and, and all the places, places in between, I, I don't mean to skip over all the places, but I, I just wanted to show you that we can be involved everywhere from the very beginning to post-marketing. Post um, so, Strictly speaking, or defining what is a community advisory board, it's simply a group of patients who offer their expertise to any sponsor of clinical research. The, um, the research could be overall program development of a product from beginning to end, or it could simply be looking at one single protocol today and giving advice into that, or it could be aspects beyond uh, the research program as well that include things like access to to the to the treatment or to the to the therapy um, so more 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 political or policy issues as well can be discussed in a cab in a community advisory board and these 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 patients, this group of patients that we'll just call a cab, um, advises if there are more than one sponsor in any in any disease area, that they advise all the sponsors in or as many as the sponsors as possible in the field. Um, so there's no no so there's no idea of of um, only only giving advice to one out of many um, companies in in or sponsors in in a, in a field. Um, and whenever possible, I think it's really important to to say that the agenda of the meetings and of the of the work, um, as well as the secretariat and and the logistics, are something that are driven by the patients. That is, it's not an invitation from the sponsor, but it's actually a structure developed by the patients where they invite the the sponsor to to meetings. Um, and we see that there's a lot of value to do it this way. Um, we think that development time of therapies can be shortened. Um, patient relevant outcome measurements um, can be developed with uh, the sponsor. Um, I, I've noticed that uh, many sponsors are very interested in, de in develop developing useful and helpful um, patient reported outcomes. Uh, measurements so uh, with with cabs and with groups of patients so that's an area that um, would probably be be very helpful for for companies to to work with um, we think the community advisory boards would would basically help with recruitment because it would be a trial that more reflects the needs of the patient so hopefully recruitment would be easier and at the same time there would be less dropouts less people who don't continue till the end of the trial because again the trial is designed really 
with the patients in mind by the patients. Um, other other areas that can be worked on that um, if they if they don't already exist in disease areas are registries to get a better idea of, for example, the natural history of a disease and how it impacts on the development of products. Um, for, I think for for companies, lots of times they actually don't know the rare disease environment that well, and it's an opportunity for them to start to get to know real people living with the disease or people, parents of people living with the disease, et cetera. And all of this goes to hopefully end up with approval, um, market access, coupled with real life experience and a sense of social responsibility. And I think all these things can be can happen by by a cab working very closely with, with a sponsor. Um, so just to give an idea of how we see cabs or see meetings with companies. Um, generally, companies have their advisors, whether they be clinicians or patients, key opinion leaders, etc. But they're, they're meetings that the, the sponsor controls, the sponsor puts the agenda together, the sponsor has specific questions, and they go to the meeting and they say, hey, advisors, does this make sense? Or how do you like this? Um, but it's a series of, let's say, one-off meetings that don't have any, any thread or any, connecting, um, any, any, any connection be between them. Um, and what, what we saw, what both Francois and I saw in the, let's see if I just click on that. No, I have to click here, sorry. Um, what we saw in the mid 90s was that perhaps there was another way of doing this, this um, meeting of multi-sponsors where the patients could be in the, in the center um, sort of uh, managing the process and the patients could invite different sponsors to to meetings. Um, we'll show you some specific ex specific examples of meetings um, later on in, in, in today's talk. Um, and we could also invite um, experts to have meetings with experts as well, because we, we know lots of times that we'll need advice um, and input from from other 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 experts in, in the field. And so just very quickly, this is just to give you, this is just some beautiful slides to, to remind you that really um, cabs are useful, not only in sort of my old way of thinking for, for drugs in, um, in, into bodies, but into all health technologies, um, which includes pills, it includes wearables, it can include injectables, um, it can include gene therapy, um, it can include complex um, surgeries. And so I, I think that there's there's room for giving advice and help to sponsors in in all these these areas of of um, what we call health technologies. Um, for the I, I think the the global scope of a cab. Um, I, I sort of mentioned it briefly earlier, but this goes into more detail. Is that um, we can look at the trial protocol. Um, very, very specific um, for for one protocol from designing it all the way through to to carrying it out. Um, but and and not only not only just one part. For example, informed consent. I personally think informed consent is a major area that patients can give good advice on. But there are there are many other places within clinical trials that that also can be affected by and and and. Um, and, and better designed by patients, including inclusion exclusion criteria, um, patient reported outcomes, um, the, the objective of the trial is the question, a sensible question. These are things that patients can give um, valuable insight into. Um, but also patients can work on, on, on strategy trials. Um, I mentioned earlier being in, in a US clinical trials network where we didn't work um, on individual products, but we worked on strategy. What, will, what is the strategy of treatment for in this disease area? And, and, it, and again, that, that meant that mm, competitors or became collaborators because in fact, we looked at more than one thing at the same time. 
and it's a very useful thing to to start getting sponsors to think about that there's a world out there beyond my product and i think that that's something we do very well is we show them that there are other ways of looking at their at their products um, of course we're as patients always interested in compassionate use programs once trials are recruited um, is there an option for getting access to this drug in in another format um, before approval again this is something that um, we we talk about with 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 companies with sponsors and and just going back beyond the single trial we actually are very interested in in the whole pipeline um, many times companies have more than one product and it's it's an opportunity to get an overview of what is in their what is in their portfolio and what are their plans for that portfolio. Again, it's it's a place where we as patients can give them very useful advice on how to move forward. Um, and again, again at the end um, on the right, um, access is really important. And really, access is in many times just another word for pricing. Um, how expensive is this product? And so we. Um, we bring access issues to the table as well, which isn't strictly research, but again, it's something that can't be avoided, uh, especially um, in today's world with the, the limited budgets that there are in, in, in healthcare. Um, the, oh, just, just to mention, um, people from community advisory boards might also be involved in the data safety and monitoring boards of trials um, and, and, and so forth. Um, so we have two true stories. Um, I'm hoping that Francois can speak himself on the first one, and then I'll I'll tell you about my story. Yes, thanks, Rob, and uh, good morning to to all. So this was uh, a meeting where we had uh, patients both from the U.S. and and Europe. A company was developing a a, a, tri a, a new product. And they had just completed the phase two, so they had some data on activity and safety. And from these trials, the, the meeting, the purpose of the meeting was to design together the efficacy trial, the phase three trial. And they had just met with clinicians and they had just decided on the dose to continue the development with. Um, and we looked at the data, we saw that the highest tolerated dose was extremely active uh, in terms of severe uh, side effects, grade three or four. Uh, the profile was comparable to uh, the comparator, nothing spectacular, spectacular, nothing different. But then we saw that there was a grade two side effect, so a grade two typically doesn't need hospitalization, you, you may need some uh, uh, treatment to mitigate the, the impact, but nothing really serious. Uh, but quite frequent and quite uncomfortable. And when you know that in a clinical trial there is a certain frequency reported uh, with a side effect, 20-40% here, in reality it's higher. So we were a bit concerned and um, the, the company uh, had just discussed with the clinicians and all clinicians unanimously wanted the highest dose uh, to continue the development, uh, which exposed uh, patients uh, to these loose tools uh, in high numbers. And so we discussed that and we said that in fact, uh, we would prefer the company to select the second best dose uh, where we saw a lower frequency of the side effect, we were ready to lose on the efficacy side if we could gain on the safety side, because with fewer side effects, the, the, the idea was that patients could continue treatment much longer and then have a better uh, efficacy. Um, and then the company said, okay, uh, we listen to patients, we listen to clinicians, we don't know, so when you don't know, uh, you research, uh, you, you test. And that's what they did. They added, well, there, there were two uh, arms in the trial. Both doses were 
tested compared to placebo and compared to each other. At the time of the marketing authorization, in fact, it's the dose that we proposed, which was approved by the regulators. As we said, the overall efficacy was higher because patients could remain on these dose much more often, much longer than on the highest dose. And that was the authorized dose. And uh, so I didn't put uh, the, the outcome for the company, but this information for the, convenly, uh, for the company had an extreme financial value because overall they sold much more of that product than they thought uh, compared to their best case scenario because in fact many more patients were using that product um, because of the positive safety profile compared to their best uh, estimates. So for them it was clear that the success of this product which became a blockbuster was due to the consultation process with, uh, with the patients. So that was my uh, true story. Thank you, Francois. Um, my true story is um, happens about nine years later. Um, I was working with uh, a cab that in the same disease area, both in the United States and in Europe, um, and a company um, called Tibotech, um, which now is part of Johnson & Johnson, was looking at two drugs um, simultaneously for, for a disease. And the, they were looking at it as if there were two products, two simultaneous programs, one having very little to do with the other. And we, rem we the cab, remembered that the FDA had written a position paper in 1999 about the acceptability of using more than one experimental agent in the same trial. Um, and in fact, the, a community member who, 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 who was the editor of a, a newsletter um, actually designed a trial looking at three experimental agents in the same trial. Um, and that was around the year 2000. No company dared to do it or put it into practice, um, but the, the, the idea existed in, in, the, in the ether. Um, so, but we remembered when, when Tibotech was um, looking at these two drugs, we remembered that trial and we remembered the original FDA paper and we said to Tibotech, why don't you look at these two drugs together in the same trial? You'll save time, you'll save money. Um, what's the downside? Um, so they, we, with, with the company, um, designed what, what turned out to be a series of studies called the Duet Studies that um, looked at two drugs, both one in phase two and one in phase three. Part of the problem was that there were no, it, what, they weren't exactly synchronous in time, and that was one reason why they hadn't looked at it. But we, we figured out a way how to get approval for one drug and then possibly six months later approval for the second drug. We worked on this and we, we got agreement from, from others in the field, from experts, from, from clinicians, from key opinion leaders, et cetera. Um, and we got the, the trial uh, enrolling. It turned out to be an enormous trial. There were um, 400 people in, in the United States and there were 400 people in, in Europe in this trial. Um, and they presented preliminary findings from this trial, um, uh, intermediate findings, um, and they were so positive that the FDA actually asked the company to submit a new drug application to the FDA before the company had planned on doing so, um, which is not very, very common in, in, in the FDA. Um, so in all that just goes, um, the, 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 both drugs were eventually approved. One drug was approved um, within five months of submitting the NDA, and the second drug was approved six months later um, with, with some supplemental data. Um, so again, I think that the, the power of CABS can't be, can't be under, underestimated, and, and I think that the, the success of the company was, was greatly, had 
a lot to do with their interactions with community advisory boards. And just on the bottom, I mentioned that in fact, this company got five drugs approved over a period of nine years, three in HIV, one in hepatitis C, and one in tuberculosis. Um, and they're still they're still going forward. There's more. They're looking at more drugs again with all with all um, input from community advisory boards. They're looking at one um, that there's um, for vaginal rings for um, um, prevention of HIV and also for uh, long lasting injections, where instead of taking one pill every day, you get one injection every two months. Uh, and again, this is all with with the uh, um, c collaboration of, of the community. Um, so I think those are two very positive um, results or true stories of, of, of CAPS. Um, and so I, just to go back now to what we'd like to try to do in in Eurotis with what we're calling the EuroCAPS is that in fact patients are patient investigators, expert patients. And what we're considering is that they're could be a group of 10 to 20 trained patients, um, not necessarily, but probably in the same disease area, um, who commit themselves to a, a good chunk of time to being in this community advisory board. And if it's the larger number, 20, what we're considering is that there would be 10 active members with 10 alternative members, and they would have a, a person with whom they can discuss and, and, and um, attend a meeting if for one reason the other person couldn't. Um, they would meet at regular intervals. Um, we're seeing that once a year it may be enough depending on the amount of, depending on the amount of um, activity there is in the research uh, and development pipeline. For example, um, with, with um, Vertex and cystic fibrosis, Vertex is looking at seven clinical trials, and once a year is really not, a, not enough to, to be able to revisit all those trials. So we're seeing, we're seeing um, Vertex more often than once a year. Um, but again, it's something that will individually be figured out by the CAB with, with the sponsor. Um, Eurotis is offering um, to mentor the groups, the community advisory boards, um, not only with the organization and governance, although those are really important and we have um, standard operating procedures, et cetera, to, to help the setup, um, but, but we also can help with, with training as well as with moderation of meetings themselves. I think all those things are things that the mentor can really help with the, the development of the community advisory board. Um, the costs, which Francois will go into very briefly later, are taken are, are born or taken care of by by the sponsor. Um, this this all follows uh, two documents that were have been developed by Eurotis. One is the Charter for Clinical Trials, which is really a very uh, simple document that says that I, as a a sponsor of research am willing to work with patients. That's really what it says in a nutshell. Um, it says that over, over eight pages, but that's basically what it says. Um, and then on the other side is um, a memorandum of understanding. Once a, a group of patients believes they can work with a company, both the company and the patients um, sign a document called the memorandum of understanding that says exactly where we will work together and how we will do so. Um, I'll, I'll show you some. Uh, I'll show you further further information on that in a minute. Um, and again, the, the agendas for the meetings as well as for the program will be public agendas. We won't share anything publicly that's confidential, but we want to keep this as transparent a, pr a process as possible. So we will be opening a. Um, th there's already a part of the Eurotis.org um, website devoted to the charter, and we're going to be opening a larger. I'm part of the website to make it as transparent as possible. Um, so in a nutshell, I've already spoken to you about the charter, which um, I'm, I may be speaking out of turn, but I believe it's online. If it's not online, I'll, I'll make sure it's online in the, in the next week. Um, the memorandum of understanding is online, and you can see it at yourartist.org if you just if you just type in charter in search, the, the charter page will come up. Um, what we're offering 
is um, a seal of basically a seal of good practice that by patient groups following the Eurotis Eurocab program that that it's a it's a, a guarantee of good work from the patients and good faith from the patients to the to the, the sponsors developing um, development pipeline. Um, the code of practice I've mentioned already um, includes the, st uh, the standard operating procedures, but also includes things like declaration of interests, um, respect of confidentiality, etc. Um, many times these drugs in development are under strict confidentiality rules, um, and, and, and we need to, to respect that. Um, I've already touched on the mentor program, is that we will be able to help you not only set up um, logistically, but also for for doing things like training and, and, and running the meetings as well. Um, the EMA qualification, in, I don't know, Francois, if you want to say anything about this now or you say about, talk about it later on. Um, but again, we want to make sure that patients are considered as, as professional, as clinical investigators at the EMA. Um, but that's something that's still in, in discussion right now with, with the EMA. Um, and, fi and finally, the CAB register. What we call the CAB register is the, is the, um, the new website that will be developed that includes all the documents you would need to, to work on, on a CAB. I think I'm getting near the end of mine, but I just wanted to show you that the, um, the idea of this Eurocab program is that there will be an agreement between Eurotis and the CAB um, that will be um, sealed by a, a seal of, of, of good practice. Um, there will be an agreement between the CAB and the sponsors, which is the memorandum of understanding. And then there's the agreement between Eurotis and the sponsors, which is the charter, um, the charter for clinical trials. And that's that's the seal. It comes up a little later. Sorry about that. Um, and so um, let's, um, Jean-Marc. Perhaps we can open up the the phones now for a minute to see if there are any questions before we go forward with Francois. If you have any questions, um, raise your raise your hand on the little on the little um, person so we can get to you okay Werner has a question Jean-Marc, can you open up Werner? You can do that, okay. And then Hermine. First Werner. Jean-Marc. Sorry, Werner. Um, let me see. Enable video, enable drawing, record, make host, make presenter. I think Jean-Marc should do something. Is no, I um, no, Werner. I can't hear you yet. I'm just waiting for the technician to to jump in. Hi. Else, Werner, maybe you can type your question. Hi, everyone. Just to tell you that your microphones are open, so. You can click on the icon, uh, the microphone icon that should turn green. And if it's green, your microphone uh, will be able to hear you. And use the, um, the icon of the man raising hand if you have a question that you want to ask. Thank you. So, Werner, just make your little microphone green up top, and then we should hear you. He's typing, okay. My mic doesn't turn green. Okay, I type. So in the meantime, maybe we can take a question from...
Again, Hermine, go to the top with the microphone and it should turn green if you hit it. Yeah. All right, so Werner asks how to get in contact with the sponsors. That's generally something that we from Eurotis side see that is something the patients should do. Now it's something that we can offer advice on, but I suspect that sponsors are more willing or interested to speak with patients than to speak with your artists. We can certainly accompany you on phone calls, et cetera. Um, and also what we've been doing is we have been having similar webinars with companies to sort of get them interested in the idea the same way that we're doing this um, webinar with, with you all today. So hopefully s some companies may already know about the existence or the beginning of the existence of the idea of cabs, but we can work with you very um, specifically, let's say, um, with companies to try to get them to, to be interested in the idea. There is not a cab for hematology yet, um, so let's set one up. Right. Hey, do I hear someone? Hi. Maybe we continue and if people have questions, maybe we can ask everyone to type the, 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 the question. Regarding the potential sponsors, uh, I think uh, in all disease areas, there are patient groups and sometimes also well, or, or clinicians, uh, scientists advising the patient groups who keep an eye on all products that are coming in. Um, this is called horizon scanning that is that consists in uh, checking on the websites of all clinical trials which products are tested for for a disease or the register of uh, products which have obtained an off and drug designation these are sources of information where we uh, here, where we understand which companies are developing which products for which disease. So this is where we can identify potential sponsors. And if all patient groups uh, scan their own horizon, detect which companies are, are doing what, then you have a certain idea on which companies to, to contact. Um, we cannot scan the horizon for all rare diseases, and that's really something we need to do in partnership. We can explain you how to do that, but it would be excellent if each organization could look which products are being developed, not only pharmaceuticals, but other technologies, which companies, and then uh, we can contact uh, these companies, ex invite them to other e-meetings that we are running to industry to explain uh, the CAB program and, and we can make the link, we can match the patient networks interested by your CAB and the corresponding companies. So um, uh, Russell asks, uh, this is a tool for patient groups that are already at a certain stage of maturity, uh, especially with regard to their company relationships. Uh, about new year groups uh, and the hurdles um, it, it can represent. So that is certainly a reality. 
uh, and in fact, it's a learning process both from the patients and the companies. Most companies have never interacted with uh, patients in such a, a cab. Uh, on the patient side, it, side, it's important to realize the time needed uh, from the first discussions like today to the moment you will meet for the first time with a company. You need to identify other volunteers. You need to discuss about issues on how to run the, the, the cab before you can even start uh, uh, working on the agenda of the first meeting. And it includes also the contact with the different companies. There are situations which are more difficult when there is only one company, and especially if that company is not very rich, uh, they may have uh, difficulties to, to run a CAB, uh, a CAB meeting. Um, so there is a question from Hermine about HSP. There is no clinical research at, at the moment. Um, again, it's not only on research for pharmaceuticals. It could be clinical trials to test a new diagnostic test or a complex surgery or a medical device, typically clinical studies for implantable uh, medical devices. There are manufacturers behind all these technologies that need to run clinical trials. And it, you, a CAD can also be a platform to discuss with clinicians when establishing uh, a register in a European reference network. That's also a platform to, to discuss the practical aspects of the of the register. And as as Russell says, perhaps um, HSP could connect with um, with ataxia, for example. Um, if if there's more a little more research being done in ataxia, maybe you could combine with ataxia. But anyway, it's something. If you're interested, Hermine, we can certainly talk about. Are there are there realistic options to to moving forward and see if we can implement them. So I think we, we need to proceed because it's already 11.40 and we are only half and we will hope to have more, more questions uh, about practical arrangements. Um, and uh, of course, a patient organization can set up its own community advisory board. You don't, there is no obligation to be part of the EuroDIS uh, EuroCAB program. But what we think is that when you join the program, uh, you will benefit from our experience. Uh, at, uh, we, we will train more mentors if needed, um, because we think when you start a cab, it's extremely important that you have someone with the experience of the cab and who can liaise between the hordes, the companies, to accompany the creation of the cab. The training. Uh, training activities such as the summer school and now the winter school. This is part of the EuroCAB program, but it's also ad hoc training. For example, there is a CAB which will meet very soon and they will discuss access and reasonable price with the company. We are discussing with a health economist who is the advisor to a national HTA agency if this advisor would like to discuss with the patients um, before the patients give an advice to, to the company. So this is a, an ad hoc training on health economy and, and pricing, which we can facilitate. The, the credibility which comes from all the strong governance that we propose for the CABs with a charter, memorandum of understanding and all the rest. Uh, the standards, uh, we would like this CAB program to qualify at EMA as a procedure uh, for which the EMA will be comfortable to work with. And we will keep all CABs up to date. We will organize an annual meeting of all CAB chairs and exchange and inform regularly all the CABs on any new development of interest for the development and the evaluation of health technologies. Some are, are listed here. They are permanent uh, new initiatives uh, new evolution in the regulatory environment that you need to, to, to know and to have a proper discussion with the developers and also for the visibility uh, with the register. Um, so in other words, 
if you participate, if you join the EuroCAB program, you will all benefit from the guidelines and the advice that we can do. You can also benefit from the training and the preparation, the negotiations with companies. For those who would like to have a mentor, um, we, we have limited capacity. So this is why we, we are running a call to express interest to create a cab. We won't be able to provide a mentor for all the possible cabs. So we'll have to prioritize. So the sooner you contact us for the creation of a cab, the, the better. And there will be patient networks who that are so young, so new, or not yet structured, which can't even host the administrative and financial aspects of the cab, for which all these proposals to host this administration and financial aspects, and to for a temporary period, uh, the time needed for the network to uh, to structure itself uh, and then to continue. And then there will be cabs which will be fully anonymous from the very beginning. So depending on these uh, different needs that different networks have, and this again uh, summarizes what we have in mind, the first column are the cabs where Eurodis in fact will take care of everything. We will host all financial flows with the sponsors, we will cover all expenses, Eurodis will be paid directly from the sponsors, uh, but this we can afford for only very few networks, four, five simultaneously, and not more. Then there will be other cabs where we will propose, uh, where the, the cab will ask Eurodis if we could mentor the cab again for a certain period, one, two, three years to be defined. Uh, where the financial and administrative aspects will be dealt by the patient network and uh, the CAB will contribute to the program um, by paying a membership to, to the program uh, that covers uh, the mentoring uh, costs. And then there will be the autonomous CABs who will not request much from ORDs apart from the guidelines and, and advice and also they will pay a different contribution to be part of, uh, of the program. So based on all the estimates that we, uh, we, we, we did, and uh, in fact, what the mentoring program includes, the mentoring program includes uh, four, well, three different aspects. Um, we will run the program, I organize the program, program, that means to inform all ORDIS members. Uh, we will receive requests from some of you to create a CAB and then we will discuss uh, in practice what does it uh, mean. We will also consult EMA and other bodies like the network of HTA, which are the medicines for which uh, there is an urgent need for a successful development. Well, you will say that this is the case for all diseases, but maybe there are some products where we cannot afford uh, the development uh, to uh, not to succeed. So maybe we, we need to, to discuss if we need to prioritize which would be the, the products on which to, to prioritize. Uh, we can help with the matchmaking with industry and then the mentoring. Uh, which is to help you to prepare and to run your meetings, to keep the guidelines up to date, to develop policies, and to serve as a kind of treatment activist advisor to, to advise you in some difficult situations that you may be uh, when discussing with uh, the sponsors. So, in fact, to mentor a, a CAD meeting means that uh, two, three months before the meeting, uh, sometimes even um, earlier, you need to set a date, you need to define where to meet and who will be meeting and contact the companies to make sure uh, you will meet one, two or, or three companies. So we will help uh, with these, help to prepare the agenda with all the companies. It's extremely important that the company attend with 
the decision makers in their delegation, not only the communication or the patient engagement or the PR people, but we need the scientists of the company uh, in, uh, in the discussions, else we lose time. Uh, there will be exchange of documents, collection of comments, uh, and all the logistical aspects. That's part of the preparation. And then the meeting. So the meeting are run with a chair, uh, moderated by a mentor if needed. And there are, during the meeting, as you will see in a minute, there are sessions, there, there are meetings with uh, the company, but there are also some time for internal discussions to brief or debrief after you, you meet, you've met with, with the company. And then after each session, there is all the follow-up work to do, tracking decisions, tracking questions asked to the sponsor, uh, expecting answers, working on next steps. Sometimes it's sending a letter to a company or to uh, an agency or sometimes to an ethics committee if you have a concern uh, with the ethics of a clinical trial. So this is all the scientific secretariat work to be done after the meeting, plus the evaluation and the reporting. Uh, one example of a cab over two days where people would arrive on Thursday evening in, in a hotel that you'll have selected uh, on Friday morning, uh, the cab members will meet together, in ch uh, exchange information. In the afternoon, they could have a training if uh, uh, it was identified that uh, a pharmacologist or a trialist uh, should come and discuss with the cab members. Or if no training, there could be a first meeting with sponsor A, so that the next day on Saturday, uh, you could have a meeting uh, with a sponsor in the morning, a lunch, and uh, maybe another company in the afternoon and then departure. Uh, the next example is an uh, actual cab that uh, took place in September last year uh, for Cystic Fibrosis Europe, where people arrived on Wednesday morning. Uh, in the afternoon, they had a preparation uh, for the two meetings to come. So the next day, they had a one day meeting with Vertex and the day after one day meeting with Novartis. On Saturday morning with Rob, they had a discussion on the informed consent for clinical trials. And then with us and my colleague Matteo, we discussed organizational matters, uh, how the CAB could uh, learn from these two meetings uh, to improve and to run the, the CAB for, for the next times. And then people could, uh, could leave uh, back uh, home. Which expenses do we need to have in mind? So the cost to prepare the meeting, the time needed to contact the sponsors, to make the agenda, the exchange of documents, the logistics, the training activities. Then the cost, the expenses related to travel, accommodation, subsistence, and that will vary depending on how many participants, how many nights. On site, uh, you will probably need to rent a room, some equipment, for example, some video for the absent friends, those who cannot come in person, but who would like to listen and participate remotely, the catering. You have different options. Some are hiring a minute taker, some need a technician for the video, or you can have external trainers who would, who would request a, a fee. Uh, you have also the financial compensation for the CAB members for the work it represents. There are volunteers, but yet it represents some work. And there is this uh, proposal that for each meeting day, uh, each CAB member receive some, something between 450 and 600 uh, euros. Uh, it's not mandatory. Not all CAB members ask for, for this uh, compensation. And not all companies can afford to pay uh, a compensation. So that's really part of the negotiation. And after the meeting, there is, uh, again, some work to be done, table of decisions, evaluation, tracking, etc. Uh, plus, uh, there are other expenses uh, in this program. The annual meeting of cab chairs, so that's typically a workshop, but we need to, uh, to plan uh, this. Um, 
So to summarize, for uh, the three different models, if ORDIS takes care of everything, we estimate the cost per meeting depending on how many participants, ranging between 30 to 60,000 euros. And that will be paid directly by the sponsors to ORDIS. This cost may well, they are what they are, but they are estimates based on uh, real costs. It's very similar to the cost of the meetings with investigators. It depends how many investigators attend this meeting. And we need to be treated, we want to be treated um, as uh, investigators are. Uh, so the costs are very similar. In case the network takes care of all logistics and administrative uh, actions, uh, then we will ask the CAB to contribute to the EuroCAB program by paying a maximum of amount of 14,000 euros per, per meeting. Uh, and uh, we will explain you the detail of these uh, amounts uh, in, uh, when we enter into more direct discussions uh, on your CABs. And for the third case, those who are fully autonomous, um, they will pay a fee to be part of the program to benefit from the CAB seal and other guidelines, but without a mentoring program, so the fee to be part of the program will be lower, uh, around 1,500 uh, euros. So which company sponsors to start working with? Uh, so that's what we call horizon scanning. There are different techniques, uh, but and we can help uh, in, in this. Just to give you an idea, uh, we, we scanned uh, the horizon in some uh, rare diseases. So you see that for some of them, like cystic fibrosis or gliomas or lymphomas, there are 24, 37 designated products. Not all of them are in clinical development, but quite uh, it represents quite many products. So the, the, the cabs will first be facing a situation where they will have to select which products seem more interesting and focus on these ones because it's more than they can review and follow up. But there are other rare diseases like Neiman Peak, beta thalassemia, myasthenia gravis, or multiple myeloma, three to seven products that are designated. Not all of them are in clinical trials in development, so that's a more limited number of uh, sponsors and products. Uh, so you can have a one, two cab session per year and review, meet with all the sponsors uh, in, a, in, a, in, in your field. Um, and there are other proposed criteria to select which companies to work with. Uh, we think priorities in case you have many companies, and that's a luxury that not all rare diseases have, but in case you have plenty of companies, maybe you should favor those who use the orphan drug regulation, those who uh, use the new facilities, the new tools like scientific advice, well, not exactly new, but those we know are extremely important for the successful development of a product scientific advice or protocol assistance, those who request or plan to request early dialogue with HTA or parallel scientific advice EMA HTA, or have entered into discussion with MOCA on fair pricing, uh, or those who have applied as part of the priority medicines at EMA, or those who are good at uh, working uh, jointly at the European level, for example, for ULETA, and exclude those that have uh, records of bad practices uh, in terms of relations with, uh, with patient organizations, for, for example. So with all these, we think that the next steps for you uh, should be from this webinar to discuss with your peers whether you would need a cab for your disease. And if you think this is something of interest uh, in your organization or with other organizations in Europe for your disease, you can feel free to ask us, Rob and myself, to organize, to organize another e-meeting uh, with your organizations in your respective disease areas where you can discuss the cab in greater details. 
and we have already started with five or six networks and some have already started their, their, their caps. Then we can guide you on how to scan your horizon, identify potential developers who could be interested to work with you. And it, as I said, in parallel, we are discussing with industry. And on the 16th of October this year, there is a Eurodis Roundtable of Companies workshop with uh, 70 companies investing in rare diseases who will be present. And the workshop will be about uh, the community advisory boards program. So most companies active in rare diseases will have a possibility to discuss, uh, to see what the program consists in and uh, discuss how to establish contacts with existing cabs or how to create uh, new cabs. And in that meeting, see in your... sorry, just wanted to say sorry? That in that meeting, we'll also have many. Sure, sure, yeah. Uh, and then uh, if you can start looking in your calendar, when you could have uh, opportunities to meet with other patient groups uh, in the year to come or next year, if there is, for example, a medical conference uh, where several of you will attend or at the General Assembly, or if you are part of a European Federation, like the European Federation for Hemophilia or for Epidemolysis Bullosa, uh, that could be one day added to when your Federation is meeting to add uh, a cab uh, and discussing with, uh, with the company. Um, after this series of e-meetings, we will um, send a call to Aurodis members to express interest to create a cab. For the moment, we have a limited capacity in terms of the numbers of mentors. Um, so please do not hesitate too long. Contact us uh, as soon as you can. Uh, we will guide you through the preparation period. We have also, we propose preparatory meetings with companies that are still hesitating to join a cab. Uh, these are short meetings where we discuss really the, the purpose of the cab and the practical arrangements. Uh, these are important because uh, you don't enter into a cab uh, uh, with no, no preparation. So that's my uh, last slide. Uh, it's uh, 12 or three already, but I'm sure there are there are probably other questions or reactions or comments. Um, so feel free to raise the, the hand and ask uh, I questions. saw that Chris had his, Chris raised his hand earlier. I don't yes. know if he still has a question. I have, I have raised my hand. Thank you both uh, Rob and Francois for this presentation and webinar and for uh, both of you and the team in Eurodis to having developed this um, uh, concept, which is very, very interesting. Uh, I have a couple of questions, actually. So once I've got the, the microphone, I will ask both of them. First of all, I wanted to have some clarification regarding the membership of the Eurocab, whether that is going to be on the basis of patient organizations being members and nominating individual uh, patient representatives to sit on the Eurocab, or whether this is going to be membership of individual expert patients that will be sitting uh, on the Eurocab, on, on the specific disease cab, that will obviously be members of a patient organization. That's the first question. And the second question is uh, regarding some of the uh, comments and points of, on these slides. The issue about um, conflict of interest and transparency. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, a, a number of uh, community advisory groups that have been set up by sponsors have demanded for members, particularly the patient representatives on these cabs, to sign quite onerous and quite detailed uh, agreements not only in terms of non-disclosure agreement, but also agreements verging on the kind of um, uh, sort of role as a consultant to the company, uh, which obviously has very, very uh, important implications in terms of the ability of these 
uh, patients to take part as expert patients in procedures such as at the EMA, within HDA institutions, because obviously they will have to declare this and that sometimes uh, is uh, contradictory to the role and the independence objectivity that these institutions require. And I, I, I note also with interest that in one of your earlier slides, where you refer to that a little bit in terms of the EMA and the level of conflict of interest, where you um, also um, uh, make the similarity that uh, CAB members, uh, patient experts in CAB, in the CAB, will be at the same kind of level um, as uh, clinical investigators. But uh, in terms of at least the regulatory aspects, when clinical reg uh, investigators are uh, invited for oral explanations, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, within the regulatory environment, they are always considered that they are affiliated to the specific sponsor, whereas patients do not uh, fit that uh, uh, that um, role, and of course they shouldn't fit that role because they need to have a different kind of input. So, yeah. I'll take the easy question. Um, the question about patients or, or individual patients or organizations, um, I, I think in, in many regards we can leave that up to the, to the cabs as they grow. They can figure out what kind of members do we want to be. But obviously the network of patients that already exist, if it's for example Cystic Fibrosis Europe, they have a series of organizations that are attached to them. And then they make a call to all their organizations and they say, hey, anyone interested in uh, scientific research and scientific development and working in the cab and, and then describe the cab a little bit. Um, and then the people who come to the cab will be vetted, are they the right persons for this and that reason, um, but they will probably almost always be representing their organization, but um, for example when they sign the confidentiality agreement, it's them individually with the company. And Francois, do you want to talk about EMA? Yeah, ju just add something. Um, any patient can be member of a CAD. You, there is no obligation to be member of a patient organization to be member of a CAD. Yet, it is important to be connected to other patients in your country because there will be questions such as, do you think patients uh, would prefer this uh, or that in your country? Do you think one clinical trial site is enough in this place in your country or do you think another one is needed in this other city? Um, if you are an isolated patient, uh, not part of a network, you, you, you will not be able to represent and to give an advice uh, on all possible questions. So we strongly recommend to identify volunteers who are connected to a patient organization who are themselves members of a local organization or a social network. These are two valid options. Regarding conflict of interest, Chris, you're, you're right. This activity is a consultancy activity to be declared as a consultancy activity in your declaration of interest for the EMA and, and others. Yet, it doesn't really, it, the, the main limit it puts, it creates the main restriction it creates is for the patients who um, intend to become members of the scientific committees because there there is a clear uh, rule you cannot consult industry and be part of the decision making at EMA but it, it is limited because there are few patients who intend to be members of the scientific committees most patients will never, never apply to be members of the scientific committees. Yet, there are other roles at EMA, uh, like to give an advice at scientific advice meeting or the scientific advisory group or when the CHMP is consulting you. And there, 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 there are other types of restrictions, um, but uh, there is uh, how can I say, there are possibilities to consult a patient even if a patient 
is member of a, of a cab, there is the expert witness status, or uh, there are ways to, to deal with these uh, conflicts of interest. The more transparent we are, the more, for example, we make the agendas of the meetings public, etc., the more the EMA is comfortable to work with the patients. And regarding uh, the comparison with clinical investigators, what you say is true. Clinicians who come with the company are never considered fully independent. Uh, what we have in mind are the clinicians who are investigators of a clinical trial and who are consulted directly by the EMA. They are not part of a delegation uh, by industry. They attend a meeting, a scientific advice meeting. They are they have a role in a clinical trial and they are paid by the sponsor. But because they are clinical investigators and their opinion matters a lot to the EMA, uh, even if they work with a company, they are not level three conflict of interest, but level two, which means uh, more possibilities for the EMA to work and to listen to them. And this is what we would like to propose EMA members of the CAB, even if they consult with industry, if they could be considered as level two conflict of interest and not level three, then uh, this would help them give their opinion to the EMA when, uh, when needed. So that's the, the strategy we have in mind. Are there other questions? And I just wanted to say that I put our emails here, Francois and my emails, so you can send us any other questions or if you're interested in really looking into how to begin, that you can contact either of us um, to start the process. Yes, and, and there are many other open questions. There are even uh, workshops uh, on what it means to run a cab or to be member of a cab. There are issues regarding Okay, it's confidential, but uh, I still need to discuss with my peers, how can we do that? Um, how to be inclusive? Is it a closed club, a closed group of patients? How do we renew uh, the group so that we keep being inclusive and there are constantly new patients who would like to join, but yet we, we still to, we need to keep the size of the cab limited. So all these uh, questions, we have the experience, we have these, um, uh, these reports from these conferences, and these are issues we can discuss with each of you and all your networks individually if you think uh, it, it's worth exploring the possibility of creating a cab for your, for your disease. We've seen developments of products which were successful only because there was a cab uh, given the, the, the quality of the advice given uh, from the patients. There are some companies that embark into developments for medicines. They don't know exactly how to do that. They don't ask patients, they ask clinicians, but they don't have the best answers that they, they, they would need, and then they fail. Uh, sometimes, uh, if they would have asked patients for their opinion on how to develop the product, uh, they, they would have been more successful. So that's what we would like to, to ensure, to increase chances that all this research uh, are successful uh, at the end. Other questions or, or comments? If not, um, it's 12.15, maybe we can close the the, the e meeting. Uh, we will continuously send information on the next e meetings. Uh, you may attend again if there are aspects you would like to hear again, or you may share the information with uh, your friends, uh, colleagues, uh, other patients to join the next uh, e meeting. The next one will be the 14th of May uh, at 5 p.m. Uh, French time. And the idea is to have at least a new meeting every month until all Eurodis members are informed and aware about this, uh, this program. So keep posted 
and don't hesitate to discuss the, the matter with uh, with uh, other patients you you might know. So with this, thank you very much for for joining uh, today. Uh, Thanks a million. Thank you very much. The, the date of the ERTC meeting in October on the cab is the 16th, 1 6 of October. It's a Tuesday. It will be in Barcelona. And uh, we hope to have uh, quite uh, many patient advocates uh, who could uh, come to that uh, workshop. Thank you very much and, uh, and have a nice day. Bye bye.